with all of our chapters. And I am very, very grateful. Now, let me introduce our featured speakers. Paul is an attorney, former prosecutor, law professor, and author. At Georgetown University Law Center, Professor Butler researches and teaches in the areas of criminal law, race relations law, and critical theory. He is one of the nation's most frequently consulted scholars on the issues of race and criminal justice. He is also one of DC's most popular law professors. He previously taught at GW Law School, where he was awarded the Professor of the Year Award three times by the GW graduating class. Prior to joining the Academy, Paul served as a federal prosecutor with the US Department of Justice, where his specialty was public corruption. His prosecutions included a US Senator, three FBI agents, and several other law enforcement officials. While at the DOJ, Paul also worked as a special assistant U.S. attorney prosecuting drug and gun cases. He also worked in private practice at Williams Connolly. He clerked. He's done all of the things that any ACS member could ever want to do. Chokehold is a special and courageous book that inspired me in its willingness to criticize an institution in its entirety. Paul brings his experience as a prosecutor, law professor, and black man to the table as he strips bare the criminal justice system. His book is personal, thoughtful, insightful, and extraordinarily important to simultaneously ongoing and long overdue critical examinations of race, the carceral state, and the intersection of the two in this country. As he set the tone for chokehold, Paul framed policing black men as one of many lenses through which we can explore the chokehold as a tool for oppression, and specifically calling out the importance of overlapping and intersecting social identities and conversations about structures of discrimination, Paul credits Kimberly Crenshaw for developing the theory of intersectionality. Speaking from experience, I can assure you that college freshmen at the University of California, Santa Cruz won't make it two weeks before intersectionality becomes entrenched in their vernacular. A true pioneer and leading scholar in critical race theory, Kimberly has contributed scholarship and leadership to work addressing racism, gender discrimination, and the violence against women throughout her career. She is a full-time professor at the UCLA School of Law and Columbia Law School, where she specializes in race and gender studies. She's the founder of Columbia Law School Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies and the African American Policy Forum, and the president of the Berlin-based Center for Inter Intersectional Justice. It is truly an honor to welcome both Paul and Kimberly Crenshaw this evening. So without further ado, I thank you both profusely for joining us and I turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. This is a wonderful opportunity especially to have uh, a chance to talk with my good friend and, and colleague, uh, Paul Butler. Um, we're going to more or less uh, think about these 20 minutes that we have to uh, sort of stir the water, stir the pot a little bit um, with a sort of rip from the headlines uh, conversation about the ways that the themes that Paul wrote about a few years ago are still very much uh, salient at this moment, some even more so, uh, as we'll, we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, but first, uh, Paul, it's really fun uh, to have this uh, opportunity, especially because this is the first year in, I don't know, uh, maybe six years that we haven't come together at our social justice writers retreat in Jamaica. So this will have to make up for it. How are you today? I'm doing great, Kim. It's great to be here. Thank you so much to the ACS. Thanks to Molly. Thanks to my friend, Melissa Murray. And a special thanks to the fantastic set of law professors who are leading the small groups. I was blown away when I saw the list of names. If I weren't also um, leading a small group, I would want to attend each of the other ones. This is really a, a book writer's dream come true. And thanks uh, to my dear friend, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, one of the architects of critical race theory, the architect of intersectionality, uh, the creator of Say Her Name. Uh, Kim, you honor me with your presence. You're sweet, Paul. <laughs> so um, let's get into it. We, 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 we've got um, a few really uh, pressing moments happening right now that your book speaks to. Um, and I just want to start with, you know, the first one, you, you mentioned Say Her Name, and we know at this moment in the, uh, the, the, the coming together again uh, to talk about uh, police violence and, and um, anti-black racism, that gender is uh, in this conversation in a way it hasn't been 
many, for many, many years, partly because of the happenstance, I think, of Breonna Taylor uh, being uh, killed in the middle uh, of uh, uh, activation over black men who have been killed. Um, so in some ways, one would say, well, what do you have to say about that, Paul Butler? You wrote uh, a book about black men uh, uh, being caught up literally and figuratively in, in, in the chokehold. Uh, but actually, in your book, you do talk about that uh, there are ways in which black women are also uh, caught up. Um, talking about black men uh, is an intersectional project. Uh, it need not be seen as participating in black male exceptionalism. So there are two questions I want to ask you about that. So first of all, you know, what what is the line between an intersectional approach to thinking about black male vulnerability um, on the one hand and black male exceptionalism on the other hand? How do you draw that line? And then in the how, I guess I want to say, walk us through how you came to draw that line, how you came to the understanding that you had that there needs to be a line drawn between uh, these two sort of polar approaches uh, to uh, talking about black male vulnerability. So too often in racial justice work, the issues that confront black men are centered. Even when some of the things that happen to black men also happen to black women. Uh, intersectionality understand, helps us understand why that is and how anti-blackness and misogyny particularly confront women of color. So intersectionality is about the difference that race makes for gender and that gender makes for race, among other things. So intersectionality creates a space for black male focused analysis. A lynching, for example, when it happened to black men was gendered as well as race. It wasn't enough to hang black men from trees, but their penises had to be cut off. Uh, black women were also terrorized in specific ways with rape being the most prominent example. So the challenge was writing a book that highlighted the particular ways that black men encounter the criminal legal process without marginalizing the experiences of black women. So the how, how did I do it? You can tell me whether I was successful or not. Uh, the how uh, was to talk to black women, uh, to get feedback from women of color. Uh, so in Negril, where there's an amazing uh, formation of social justice writers that uh, the African American Policy Forum puts together. Uh, we had some polite meetings and then some screaming matches uh, about <laughs> whether I was getting it right, how I was getting it wrong. And part of this is born of, of activism as well. One of the reasons I admire the ACS is it's lawyers, activists, students, law professors, and we're all learning from each other. So during the process of writing Chokehold, I was also working with some activists, including uh, Kim, on ways to make President Obama's racial justice agenda more inclusive. Uh, we had worked a long time to get him to focus more on race than he had in the first term. And, and when he did, his announcement was a program, My Brother's Keeper, that centered black men. And we were concerned that, A, the program wasn't happening in an intersectional way, and, and B, that black girls and black women were living in the same anti-black environments that black boys and black men did. So what about them? And, and during that, in doing that activist work, uh, I learned a lot, and, and hopefully some of what I learned translated to the printed page. Well, let's talk a, a little bit about the, the consequences uh, of the endangerment uh, uh, approach as, as opposed to what you lay out as the race-gender intersectional approach. 
Um, and so you talk in, in, in your book about the um, how little reformist energies, particularly around criminal justice, have actually focused on structural dimensions of that, right? Um, and there's a way in which even those who justify my brother's keeper through the data on the extent to which the chokehold is actually choking the life uh, and life chances out of black men and boys still gets it wrong. Um, and so the question is how, how to paint a picture about what is getting wrong, how you can move from data uh, to an intervention that doesn't address the structural dimensions that the data reflect. So you, you, you mentioned a, a little bit about the, you know, the uh, effort to uh, uh, sort of redirect this energy. And, and one of the dimensions of that, that um, I have to say was more controversial than I thought would ever be, um, was the op-ed that you know you uh, you you were you played some role uh, in that, that 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 I wrote for the New York Times called the girls Obama forgot and one of the things I said was that the the problem in these interventions and many of them as I said are um, uh, sort of generated out of criminal injustice is that they focus on fixing men of color, particularly young black men, and they fall in the sweet spot between the conservatives who fear black men and boys and black folks who love them. And so there is this sweet spot. So I want to ask two questions. What are the consequences of this sweet spot? Like so much of the reformism coming from the idea of we're going to have a bipartisan you know, conversation. And, and as you pointed out, you know, in the book, you had, you know, your leading conservatives and you had your civil rights leaders all coming together to lift up black men and boys. So everybody's thinking, well, this must really work. And you say in your book, maybe not. So what's the consequence of the sweet spot politics that drove it for black men? And what's the, what is the consequence of sweet spot for black women when no one's really fearing for their lives, and no one really fears them either. So one thing that feminism has taught us is that the, the personal is political. Uh, so I, I started with what was going on in my, my head and heart. And, and I always have been proud to be a black man. And I certainly get the, the race part, and I wanted to think about what it means to be proud to be a black man, to think about what that meant in an intersectional way. And at the same time, we were thinking of doing work on my brother's keeper and thinking, well, what is the explanation for leaving out black girls and women? Because when you looked at the programs, what they were doing was a lot of cool stuff. Uh, a friend of mine in Queens, uh, I tried to get him on board. He was like, no, because he worked with a group of young boys and they just got iPads for all the kids, all the young men in the program through my brother's keeper. And I was like, well, don't black girls need iPads too? And again, we didn't get a whole lot uh, in terms of race justice interventions from the Obama administration. Standard disclaimer, President Obama is the greatest president of my lifetime, probably the greatest president in our history. I understand that he confronted a lot of issues that other people didn't have to confront previous presidents because of his race, and he was in a difficult position. At the same time, um, I think he could have, and I wish he had done more on racial justice. And when he did, <laughs> I, I wish that it was more inclusive and that uh, women and girls were centered as well. So when I thought about uh, the work generally and, and what it means to uh, have a truly intersectional intervention, uh, I'm not against black male focused programs, but the idea, and again, this is returning to my interest in unpacking my pride in, in being a black man. Uh, what does it mean uh, to understand at the same time that white supremacy has distorted black masculinity 
in specific ways, uh, but is there a way of rehabilitating masculinity, including black masculinity, uh, that's not anti-woman, that's not misogynist? And, and I think there is. And I, I think that there are programs uh, that are going on all over the country, including many um, sponsored by the Movement for Black Lives, that are working it out, uh, that are working out how to do intersectional programs, including programs that are about black women, black men, black non-binary people, people of color, uh, that embrace uh, the diversity within all those groups. And, and we learned that, Kim, from, from your work. We learned that from intersectionality. Yeah. Well, um, so speaking of presidents, I guess, you know, we, we, we should transition to the more contemporary uh, president uh, and, and his engagement with uh, structural dimensions. So I'll say, you know, it seems to me that one of the differences between an, an endangerment approach and an intersectional approach is an endangerment approach actually uh, as you point out in your book, doesn't identify the structures that actually endanger black men and boys. Um, and if you were to infer from the programs and the point of interventions, one would think that you know the reason Trayvon Martin got killed has something to do with the behavior of black boys themselves, or their relationships with their fathers, or you know, um, lack of assets. Um, none of those things had anything to do with Trayvon Martin uh, being killed. So um, behavioral kind of approaches that seem to be part of the endangerment frame would presumably be different from the structural kind of approaches that are based on intersectionality that looks at patriarchy and sexism alongside with white supremacy. Those are structural dimensions, not simply behavioral ones. Now, this is sort of classic critical race theory, but now we've been told that critical race theory um, is, um, should, should be sought out and extinguished, uh, that, it, it is, that it's the greatest threat to Western civilization, um, be that, yeah. So, aside from wanting to giggle at it, um, there is a reality uh, behind this attack, uh, which suggests that there is there is a, a sense that anti-black racism, uh, when it gets taken up seriously, uh, is a threat, and it's a threat that needs to be extinguished. I wonder how um, you would uh, have addressed this. Uh, if you were writing the book today, is this part of the chokehold? So, I remember the African proverb, the poet who is not in trouble with the king is in trouble with her work. The poet who is not in trouble with the king is in trouble with her work. So, it's a sign of the success of critical race theory that we're in trouble with the king, that the president feels threatened by us, and he should. The crits are coming for his white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative agenda, and we are going to win. Uh, the challenge is, in this moment, uh, whether crits will be the Willie Horton of this presidential campaign. Now, it wouldn't make sense. I'm fairly certain that neither Joe Biden or Kamala Harris identifies as a crit. So to the extent it's politics, I hope it won't work. But the New York Times described the movement for Black Lives as the most successful social justice movement in American history. And the movement is polling way better than civil rights movements did during the time that Martin Luther King was alive. So uh, I think Trump might try, but I, I hope it won't work. It, it's red meat for his base, but his base is already down with the white supremacist program. So I, I don't think that demonizing critical race theory is a way that he's going to grow his base. It has nothing to do with the almost 200,000 people in this country who die from COVID or, or people not being able to pay their, their rent or put food on the table. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, there there is a, there is a way in which I guess you know the, the first person that told me about this basically uh, said something along the lines of your poem, Chuck Lorre, and said, "Well, I guess we must be doing something right." Um, but there is also you know a part uh, of of the situation that that makes me wonder. Uh, whether this really is just about um, all anti-black racism and, and not critical race theory at all. It's just sort of um, everything is lumped up together to uh, say that any kind of advocacy around racial justice is the disease. And so that, that takes me to um, whether this, this tension makes sense to you, Paul. It seems to me that post-racialism and, and, and the whole embargo about race talk, which your book is all about, uh, is effectively saying um, we don't need to talk about race anymore. But on the other hand, uh, race always gets talked about as a justification for you know, the data that we see. Race is at the center of every effort to uh, justify uh, the disparities that you talk about in the book. So would you say that there is an embargo on, or at least post-racialism, colorblindness, it's an embargo on talk about racism, but not an embargo on talk about race. Because race seems to be all they got, really, to justify all of the chokehold problems that you talk about. So we have a summer where it's okay to talk about race. Uh, we have this national reckoning. One of the lessons of critical race theory is that racial justice is not a process that goes up and up and up and just gets better. But rather, racial justice goes in waves. Sometimes things are more just. Sometimes things are less just. But to the extent that the focus on race now, and there are some positive policy issues that are happening as a result, especially in the states. So if we want to think of this as kind of ascending, uh, what we know is that there will be a descent. And, and there was a descent, ironically, during the time of the first African-American president, when a lot of folks thought the problem had been fixed. And there was this idea, Kim, you and I talked about it called racial fatigue, right? That some people, uh, I think mainly white people, were just tired of talking about race. And we had a black president, so can't we just move on to the, to the next thing? And, and, and I think it's incumbent on folks in the ACS to say that, no, uh, we are going to continue to talk about race and gender and homophobia and the ban on trans people in the military. Um, and we're not going to get sick of it at all. Uh, we're going to continue to press those movements. I know that we're getting short on time. One of the things I, I think about uh, when I have this discussion about what's next and what folks should be doing is what I would have done. I often wonder, like during slavery, uh, what would I have done if I'd been a slave? And I hope that I would have been a runaway. <laughs> I, I hope that I would have been one of those people who led rebellions and uprisings. The reality is that we know that most people, including most enslaved people, didn't do that. And, and then mm -hmm. during the civil rights movement, I, I hope that like my mom, I would have marched with Martin and taken it to the streets with Malcolm. And we know the reality is that most people, including most black folks, didn't do that. Uh, the movement for black lives has taught me, if you want to know what you would have done back in the day, ask yourself, what are you doing right now? And, and what you're doing, Kim, uh, what a lot of people in ACS are doing is getting in trouble with the king. That's good trouble, as John Lewis would have said. That's good work. And is that what makes you optimistic about this moment? Well, who said I'm optimistic? <laughs> well, so uh, I'll, I'll dial to that. Are you optimistic about, or is there anything in this moment that does give you direction, guidance, hope, 
um, get you up in the morning, uh, allows you to read the headlines and, and not want to go back to bed. Hope is, is, is different from optimism. So things that, that give me some measure of hope is, again, what's going on in the states with regard to criminal justice reform. So Virginia had put it on the back burner uh, after the cops murdered George Floyd, the Virginia state lawmakers had an emergency session uh, where they focused on criminal justice reform. Uh, there's conversations going on all over the country about defunding the police. That's amazing. Abolition uh, isn't just this brilliant idea from a philosopher and activist like Angela Davis. Abolition is now something that lawmakers are thinking about. What does it mean to decarcerate? So that's new, that's different, that's exciting. Um, at the same time, every year, uh, the police kill 1,000 people a year, uh, and this year they're right on track. So at the end of the day, what, what we need is for the police to stop killing and beating up and arresting black people in circumstances when they wouldn't do that to white people. And there's one question about whether the reform will advance that effort. As I note in Choco, the system is working the way it's supposed to. If it's not broken, then there's nothing to fix. And so to that extent, I'm all over the place on, on reform. But what I do know is that when it works, uh, it saves lives, right? It prevents, at least in the short term, uh, the police from killing and beating up as many people as they would have without the reform. So it, the reform is good. Uh, I think it's, it, it's a step. Uh, where we want to get is the transformation. We didn't talk about reforming slavery. We talked about abolishing it. We didn't think about reforming the old Jim Crow. We thought about abolishing it. So I don't think we should only think about reforming the new Jim Crow. Uh, I think we have to think about transformation. Thank you, Paul. Well, um, I'll just wrap up because I know that now we're going to go into small groups and and go deeper into the conversation. The last thing that you said did remind me of the fact that when the civil rights movement first started, when the Montgomery bus boycott first started, um, the idea was reform, right? It was like, let's have a better, more equitable segregation system in the buses. There are black seats and white seats. They, the white seats don't get to keep moving back to the black seats the more white people get on the bus. And because Montgomery was resistant to even that, right, it sort of uh, the rigidity of the system actually led to its demise because then as Coretta Scott King said, well, you're not going to be reasonable. Then we're just going to go for the whole thing. And we are going to try to abolish uh, segregation. So the interesting question is, is that where we're at now, uh, given the resistance to reasonable reforms as it radicalized the demand so much uh, that we're closer to an abolitionist approach than we've been in a very long time. So thank you, Paul. Always a pleasure. And I'll turn it back over to our host. Thank you both for getting such a great conversation started. I'm would imagine we could all sit here and easily just listen to both of you talk all day, but um, it's even better to be able to start engaging in the conversation. So for folks who are participating today, um, we are going to be breaking everybody up into breakout groups. They will be randomized um, and we will slowly be giving you access to turn on your volumes and your cameras. So as soon as you are able to do so, feel free to turn those